Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. We now turn to Robert Frost's classic Mending Wall. I'm with you uh, on page 878, 879 in your hymnals. <clears throat> Let me pause for just a moment uh, as you're looking at page 878 and point out that my job here with you as we have these exchanges, these conversations, is not to convince you to like the writers or the texts, but to begin to appreciate or to respect what it is that the writer, poet, speaker, novelist, whatever, is trying to accomplish. My ultimate hope is that you will find some interest in going on to find other titles. I mean, think about this. We only look at just a few titles of Robert Frost here as we're studying together. He wrote thousands and tens of thousands of more lines of poetry. And you can Google that kind of stuff and you can find it on your own. And it kind of uh, sometimes tells me that the project for me is actually working when a student will come to me and say, I read another poem that's not in our textbook by Robert Frost. Are you familiar with blah, 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 blah? And that tells me that you're kind of starting to experience this stuff on your own. As I've sometimes said to students, all it takes is one good read, just one to convince you that the exchange of ideas through writing and reading can be quite compelling. Speaking of compelling, look at the top of 878 and please identify that above the title Mending Wall, in red, there is those two words, exemplar text. Now I have juniors that are sometimes stunned that the exemplar text title, which basically means this is one of the most important titles you will read in your junior year, that the exemplar text title isn't applied to birches, which many of my juniors say is easily could be, isn't applied to stopping by woods on a snowy evening, but is applied now to mending wall. So right away, let's say it. You want to sit up and take some very important notes here because we are about to engage in what many believe is Robert Frost's most influential poem. Now what made this poem so influential is had a lot to do with the time in which it was written and received. No question, we'll get to that later. The thing I, uh, I love to teach this poem, the thing that makes me uh, love to teach this poem is that this is a poem which requires some prior knowledge that many of our students in Wyoming don't have. So let's take some quick notes. Let's talk about the history of fences. Now that's going to seem strange at first. It's kind of like a lot of the things we don't understand as being vitally important. Like for example, it's very hard to find a town that doesn't have a river or a creek next to it. Just start thinking about all the towns that you know in your community and ask a simple question. Is there a river next to it? I've had juniors that kind of go, whoa, I, that's, wow, that's kind of true. Right. Water matters. Fences matter. Now, we live in a country out here where the primary type of fence is, of course, what? Barbed wire. But there's a reason for that. We raise cattle out here, right? And so you have to be able to keep your cows, your cattle, sometimes your ponies, inside of a confined area. And the way you do that is through barbed wire. However, back in New England, we use, we have fences they're just not barbed wire fences, but rather they are stone fences, okay? And the way that the stone fences work is you are going to pile rock on top of rock to create these fences or these walls. And if you take a look at 878, 879, they've actually shown you one of these walls or fences, okay? And the reason why you don't need barbed wire for these kinds of fences, by and large, is that in New England, you have orchards, lots of orchards, trees. And because you're not trying to keep in or out livestock, you don't need a fence. You need a stone wall or a stone fence. You don't need barbed wire fence. Okay. But there's a problem with this kind of fencing. Let's just say it out loud. 
The problem with this kind of fencing, kind of like we have problems with barbed wire fencing. I mean, over time, what happens with barbed wire fencing? Livestock come, knock into it, a pickup truck runs into a post, maybe knocks it down, you gotta go out, you gotta repair the barbed wire fence, no question. But the problem with rock fences, stone fences, is that they don't use any kind of cement. You just pile the rocks on top of each other. Which means, of course, that by the end of winter, what's going to happen to a lot of the rocks inside of the fence? Right, they fall down. So, what happens? Every spring, you have to go through a process of mending or fixing the wall. Does that make sense? And so, the owners of properties will come together Unless, of course, you own both sides of the, the wall, then you usually have to do it by yourself or with somebody else. But the owners of properties and property lines are, are made by these fences will come together in the spring and they will mend the wall. In other words, they literally walk the line. Oh, the line of the fence. And they're going to pick up a rock and they're going to put it back on the fence, the wall, Pick up another rock. Now, why would the rocks get knocked down? Any number of reasons. Of course, when it snows as much as it snows there, and it freezes, and then it thaws, it's obviously going to dislodge rocks. You can have wildlife that will do it. You can have humans that will do it. We'll even get into some of the reasons in the poem. Okay. So in the spring, you have this mending wall time. Okay. Now, back in New England, this is an activity that a lot of people would know about. So when Frost wrote his famous poem, Mending Wall, right away, as readers of New England start to read this poem, it makes total sense. I've had lots of students who try and read this poem, and they cannot figure out what is the activity that is going on in the poem. And the answer is, quite literally, they are fixing or mending the wall. Two people on two different sides of the wall. Let's read the background information. I'm with you on 878. Much of Frost's poetry reflects not only the New England landscape, but also its distinctive personalities. Despite Frost's city roots, he was able to gain the acceptance of his country neighbors and to enter their world, a place that was usually closed to outsiders. In doing so, Frost gathered a wealth of material for his poetry. No question. Now, let's just allow ourselves to, remember we define learning as connecting of new information to old information. Let's just do this. Let's play this game for a second. When you read earlier poems by a poet, you can sometimes then be informed about the next poem that you're going to read. We've now read two offerings together in this class of Frost's, right? Birches and Stopping by Woods, Stopping by Woods on a Snow Evening. And in both of those, let's remind ourselves what happened. Are you ready for this? Something very simple, a simple word picture, turns into a kind of profound observation that left one or two of us going, yeah, that's, that, is an interesting, that is an interesting question right there. So we're going to guess, and you would be dead on right if you did guess, that in this poem, Mending Wall, we're going to play the game again. What makes Frost's poetry so popular in its day and continues to make, be popular is that Frost works with the most simple of everyday life observations that can then be understood as having a profounder, deeper meaning. We'll see this exemplified, exemplar text, exemplified brilliantly in this poem. Let's now turn to the poem itself. Let's just read the poem one time through. And let's ask you how well you're developing or evolving as a reader. When we finish, can you write down at level one what you think is going on, literally, in the poem? Summary, level one. Let's read together. Mending wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one 
has seen them made or heard them made. But it's spring mending time. We find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. There, where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I'm apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head, why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind, his father saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences, make good neighbors. Okay, I'll pause. You jot down at level one. Do you have any idea what's going on in this poem at the summary level? At the summary level. Now, there are people who love Johnny Cash's song, Walk the Line. They just don't know what that even means, walk the line. Well, walking the line quite literally means mending the wall. Well, what does that mean? It means literally an activity that happens in the spring. So, quite literally, this is a poem about two men who are neighbors who come out in the spring. Do you have a sense they've done this before? Do you have a sense this is an activity they've done before. You bet. You got it. You got it. Every spring. Every spring you got to do this, right? Where they get together and they walk the line. By the way, if you've got acres and acres of orchard, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done, right? For those of you, by the way, who know Stephen uh, King's Shawshank Redemption and more particularly, you know, the film, um, at the end of the film, actually, one of the characters uncovers, digs up, some important information next to a huge tree, next to one of these walls, one of these stone fences, these walls, okay. So the first part of the poem is quite literally two guys walking the line, fixing the fence. Okay, it's that simple. But the second part of the poem is more interesting. The speaker of the poem says, you know, I like to ask my neighbor something. The guy who's working with me and we're picking up these, you know. And it's a simple question. Why are we doing this? I mean, really? If we had cows, it would make sense because we got to keep cows in our own pasture. Your pasture, your cows, my pasture, my cows. But we ain't got no cows. I grow pine trees, you grow an apple orchard. Why do we do this every spring? Why do we come together, walk the line, and mend the wall? What's the point of it? It seems kind of dingy to do this every year. Why don't we just go ahead and let the wall deteriorate, dissolve over time? Because he says it's clear something doesn't like a wall, the opening line, right? The wall has a tendency to come down. Nature, hunters, dogs want to get to the rabbit. Why don't we just leave the wall down? Like, what do we... Why do we do this every spring? We don't really have a need for the wall. The response, of course, will be significant. The only answer that his neighbor will give, and he gives it twice, is good fences make good neighbors. Now, at the level one summary reading, what do you think that means? Good fences make 
good neighbors. Here the word good for fences means what? Strong fences, well-built fences, to use the title, well-mended fences. Make good neighbors. Neighbors? What do you mean good neighbors? Jot down what you think he means when he says this. Good fences make good neighbors. Well, think quite literally about the way you mend the fence. The best way to mend the fence is what? For the two neighbors to get together. Yes? And they're going to do what? Can you kind of see it in your mind's eye? They're going to walk up to each other. They're probably going to reach across this, the fence at least one time and say, Morning, Bob. Morning, Jim. Well, here we are again, back at the spring. I guess let's do this project. It's going to take us most of the day, maybe longer. <sighs> All right, let's walk the line. Every one of the rocks that fall on my side, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to, I'm going to put it there. Sometimes those rocks are going to tip. And <coughs> you almost have to say, stay there till my back is turned. Because of their own accord, the rock will fall off again. We're going to do this project. Good fences make good neighbors suggests what at level one and summary readings? It's the one time in the year when they what? Right, when they get together, right? In other words, the fact that we have to build the wall gives us an excuse to come together at least once a year. The sense, of course, is that these are New England farmers and ranchers, very similar to Wyoming farmers and ranchers, who kind of spend time to themselves. Can we say it that way? They don't spend a lot of time going to tea parties and having conversations with other people. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the time we get together and fix the wall makes us better neighbors because we are reminded that we have to build the wall and mend the wall together. Good fences make good neighbors. He says it twice. And that's kind of the summary of the text. As we have noticed with frost offerings in the past, man, they always start out so simple. Here we are in a few lines, walking the line, mending the wall. Good fences make good neighbors. That's literally what the poem says. But I can already tell by the looks in some of your eyes, you're like, yeah, but. Yeah, there is a yeah, but. Because level one reading is the epidermal level. Epidermis. You know that term from your biology class, right? The surface. The epidermal level. Level one. But we got to go beneath the epidermal level. I mean, if this was nothing more than a stupid poem about two idiots that show up to put rocks on top of each other to make a wall, exemplar text would not be at the top of page 878. You agree with me? So clearly, something else is going on here. One of my students once said, I think that's the whole point of your class. You're always wanting to convince us that something else is going on here. What I would say about that is, that's called level two and level three reading. You can read the poem and go, once you have a bit of background knowledge, you can go, oh, this is a poem about two cats who are fixing their wall. Right, 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 that's what it's about. Okay, well, let's just close the book and go away. No, 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 that's level one. Oh, there's more? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There is more. It's called level two and three. So let's go to it. And let's ask some very simple questions to begin with. What, underline the word, really is going on in this poem? What really is going on in this poem? And by the end of the poem, at level two, we're going to go, oh, Frost is saying something. Saying something about what? What's the title of the poem? saying something about walls and the ways that we fix walls and the ways that we build walls and the ways that we rarely challenge the idea of walls. It's right there in the opening line. It's just you missed it because you were reading at the literal level. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even too can pass abreast. Opening line, opening thought, not line, opening thought. Put it in your own words now. Opening lines, what is it that he says? There seems to be something counterintuitive about wall building. There seems to be something that wants walls not built, but torn down. Why? 
build a wall and stand back and wait a year or two and watch what happens. And short of a wall like the Great Wall of China, after a few years, it will start to what? Crumble, dissolve. Look at barbed wire, what happens over time? It gets rusty, doesn't it? What happens to the wood of the posts? It starts to deteriorate, doesn't it? Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it. That's what makes many of the rocks fall. Nature. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. There seems to be a suggestion that walls are unnatural, not natural. Take a ride out into the badlands and tell me how many walls you see. No, no, no. Walls are something that have to be constructed intentionally. But there's two parts to a wall. There's two parts to a fence. Any rancher will tell you this. One is building it, constructing it. What's the other one? Keeping it viable. You have to mend it. You have to work at keeping it a wall. Because why? Well, the minute you put up a fence, it starts to already deteriorate and sag. The minute you build a stone wall, it starts to, every spring, it's almost as if nature comes along and says, no, 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 no. we don't need a wall. Get rid of the rocks. There's others things that tear down the wall. Keep reading with me. He says, the work of hunters, line five, is another thing. In other words, it isn't just nature that wants the walls down. Hunters have the same tendency. Another thing, he says, I've come after them, what hunters, right? And made repair where they've left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. He says, it isn't just nature that seems to want this wall down. It also seems to be humans. He says, hunters love to come, around, come along and they're like, they don't want to climb over the walls. They just want to go around or through the wall. Or their dogs want the rabbit that's hiding in the wall, right? And so let's just tear it down. Humans, it seems, naturally, don't want walls. 